internet historian has released a video recently within the past like month or so and uh people have been going i feel oh! like it's been thousands of comments i know it's not been, but it feels like thousands of comments of people just being like man in a cave internet historian new here comes shorty mm -hmm. you can see his shadow right here <laughs> So yeah, a lot of people want us to watch this video. A lot, a lot. A lot. And they've been expecting it every single day. So we're finally doing it. We're going to do it. Man in Cave is the name of this. I don't even know. The only thing I can think of in this scenario is like some kind of mind disaster or some kind of situation where this guy went spelunking and found himself oh caught in a cave. Oh my god. So I didn't know what spelunking was. Mm -hmm. And there we live in the Appalachian Mountains. We live in the wilderness. There's not a lot to do. There are so, a bunch of caves. So one weekend I went to, there's a thing called the Natural Tunnel. Mm -hmm. There's also a natural bridge, but that's not where, but there's a natural tunnel. Mm -hmm. And I went there and as I pulled in, there was a sign and it was like spelunking today at like 1.30. And I was like, well, look at the time, you know? Let's do Here this. Here we are, yeah. I don't fucking know what spelunking is. So I called them. They're like, yeah, we have room. And I have been in caves before. Mm -hmm. We went to this one cave on vacation as a kid where there was like, it was like a natural cavern and they had like water and like mm -hmm. blonde fish. Yeah. Um, and when we did that, there were like handrails and stairs and it was just this massive cave. Mm -hmm. And I expected it to be like that. It was not. It was not. I had to have special permission because I had these like flip flops that connected like around my ankle. Should have never let me in. And we get to the place where we meet up and I yes. think, okay, we're just gonna go into a cave because that's what I've right. done before. There's a school bus and they start handing out helmets and knee pads. And I was like, I don't know what I signed up for. I had like, a Harry Potter t-shirt on and like some short shorts and mm -hmm. everybody else is like ready to go and yeah. they're fit. And you're dressed like Laura Croft. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe I'm getting myself into something, but like nobody's saying anything. We drive in the school bus in the middle of the woods. We hike. I swear to God, it's like 95 degrees plus this day. Yeah. We hike straight up a mountain over a mile. I'm in the <gasps> back with Granny. Mm -hmm. Literally, there was this lady who was like well into her 60s. And I'm back there with her like, dear God. And at the time, I didn't know that I had medical issues. Right. I get to the top of this thing. We're in a group probably with like 15 people and I nearly pass out. When you go into the cave, it's cold. And yeah. so we're going from like really hot weather where I just hiked. Right. And I went in and I was like flatlined. I was laying down and everybody's like, well, this bitch was going to ruin our time. Yeah. A couple minutes later, I just start doing the thing. And I'm like going into these tiny little... And I was like much smaller then. And I was like almost stuck then. And I like if you were a person with some, some extra on you, you ain't fitting into these places. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. I was like, I'm never doing this again. I didn't like it. I would Way never do it. Way too claustrophobic. Yeah, I would never do it just because my fucking anxiety would be so high. There like, was this one is there a part. tectonic shift going to happen right now? <laughs> what if this is the earthquake for our region? You know, like, no, I'm not I dead. guess if I, if I had boots on and I went prepared and I knew what I was getting into, I might do it. Somebody could talk me into it. But there was this one part where, like, literally, like, my ribs almost didn't, like, I had to shimmy through, and it was like, you couldn't see anything but mud. <clears throat> yeah. Nope. So. Not for me. This makes me a little bit nervous. Anyway, man in a cave, internet historian, you've all waited for it and yelled about it from the rooftop, so here we are, standing, ready to deliver for all of you wonderful mm -hmm. people. Let's do it. Please behave yourselves. In the state of Kentucky, there is a cave that every now and then demands a sacrifice. There's a sand cave that I know of that people go January to. January 30th, 1925. A man walks towards the cave 
with a kerosene lamp in his hand. Hmm. He hangs up his jacket and ducks into a five-foot opening. The inside of the cave is narrow. He has to drop down on his hands and knees, crawling through a passageway filled with jagged rocks and choking dust. Been there. Then down a chute he had cleared out months earlier. Not been there. All of the daylight is gone from here, and this lantern is his only source of light. Ignoring the loose limestone rocks perched directly above him, Mm. he is now 100 feet in. And here he reaches the turnaround room. Now they call this the turnaround room because this is the juncture where even experienced cavers say, no thanks, and turn around. Mm. Because to continue on means going through this. Nah. The squeeze. A gap in the stone of only nine inches. What? For reference, here's a subway sub. Going through, he would look exactly like this. Oh, no, no, no. His arms will need to be completely at their side, and he will need to exhale so that he can reduce the size of his torso. Gradually, bit by bit, he disappears into the hole. His clothes are caught on sharp gypsum crystals, hooking into him and threatening to hold him in place. But using his feet like paddles, he pushes through. Wow. He reaches a wider opening at the other side, then crawls forward towards a ledge. Illuminated here is a 10-foot drop. A rope is already secured around a boulder, which allows him to rappel down. His worn-out leather shoes touch the ground. This is as far as he can go, and it is time for work to begin. What he is working on is another opening. At the moment, it's too small for anyone to fit through, but he will chip away at it until he can shove himself right through the other side. Because on the other side is this. A magnificent and otherworldly cave structure that will be irresistible to tourists. Every day for months he has been removing rocks from this crevice. To him, this is all just routine. So he eases further into the gap. Carefully he contorts his body through. Rocks compress the sides of his torso so close that his arms are pinned to the side of his body. He once again paddles his feet to inch down. Then, about halfway, he stops. Hmm, the lantern, it's starting to dim. He will need to go all the way back to the surface to refuel the thing. He sighs. He slowly shuffles back out, pushing the lantern with his shoulder. Then, oh no, din, crack, darkness. He has knocked over the lamp and it has broken. Now the man didn't panic. He had been caught in the dark before and he could make his way back by feel alone. So he continues worming out, leveraging his foot against what he thinks is the cave wall. But that is not the cave wall. That is in fact a rock protruding from the ceiling. As soon as he puts his weight against the rock, it breaks loose. A solid piece weighing 15 kilograms lands directly on his ankle. It aches. But he's okay. It doesn't feel as though his ankle is broken, just badly bruised and caught underneath the rock. So he shuffles to move the rock away. Suddenly, gravel. A lot of gravel. It falls onto his feet, his legs, his torso, and the weight of it all forces the wedged rock deeper into the gap underneath his foot. Pinned. Mm. He tries to push forward. He cannot. He tries to inch backwards. He cannot. Ah. He is stuck. I don't like it. I hate it. This is Sand Cave. This man is Floyd Collins. He is trapped in absolute darkness. 60 feet deep below the earth. All of his limbs held in place at the very bottom of this. Oh my god. Just like, why? No! 
How far in was that? I know it was a hundred feet into the turn. Why? But before I tell you what happens next, More add time. Peace. Speaking of people trapped in a cave, World of Tanks. I'm gonna <laughs> Google where that is. World of Tanks is not only the best game I have ever played, it is the Sand only cave? game I have ever played. It's like cars, but tanks. Yeah. Picture this. You're oh, a hot like, new T-34-85 and Can you've just tell. joined the battle because some Cromwell B tank bagged your entire family. It's time for revenge. You must use strategy. You must use stealth. You must use your wits to defeat your enemies. Use long range or short range. It's available Pause on console, but seconds. I want you to. This is the cave. Uh huh. I see people posting this on social media all the time. Yeah. Because I don't think that it's that far from us. Hold on. Oh, okay. So it's like. Five and some change. Five hours away. Yeah. Yeah. Eve, imagine a world war, but there are tanks involved this time. Oh my god. Yeah, now you get it. When you've seen as many messed up tanks as I have, you get a little cynical about the world. My god, I'm gonna be sick. <laughs> Look at all the different tanks. You can collectomize and customize them all. Baby Massive battles tank. where you can constantly team kill and ruin other people's good time. What the f I'm on your f yeah! Design engine, it's historically accurate, especially the Japanese robot tanks. Ooh, look, the tanks are kissing. <laughs> Progressive. Use the invite code TANKMANIA and get the Excelsior. 250k credits. Other stuff. Go to the link in the description and use the invite code TANKMANIA. Here's what you do. Give World of Tanks. Put that on one screen. Then, on a second monitor, you'll watch the next hour of this video while you play the game. Perfection. I'm contractually obliged to say thank you for being a friend. <laughs> Sarge, no! Tank's empty, kid. Go on without me. No, use your repair consumable. It's too late, kid. Tank care of my family. Tank for care. Me. No. Get it, 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 get it. Add o Collins is still in the dark, unable to move. His left arm was pinned underneath his torso, his right wedged by the rock ceiling above. Beneath him, sharp crystal shards dug into his skin. Ice thawed, traced across the ceiling and dripped down directly onto his face, pooling underneath him. The water was a consistent 54 degrees. Floyd tried to breathe calmly in the concentrated dark. When he did attempt to shuffle, more gravel and rocks would tumble from above and pile onto his feet, so nothing would work. He clawed at the cave walls till his fingertips were bloody, and he realized that there was only one option left. Call out for help. But wait, 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 wait. Who is Floyd, and why did he even go into a dangerous cave? Floyd has been exploring the caves of Kentucky since he was merely six years old, and as he grew up, he gained a reputation for being a very daring caver. He would dive into some hole on one side of town and emerge miles away on <laughs> someone else's property. Sup? He grew up and he became embroiled in the Kentucky Cave Wars. Now there's way too much to go into here, but the summary version is there's this huge network of interconnected caves called Mammoth Caves. It's like actually I've the largest that. cave system in the world. And there's a city right in the middle of it. Cave City, real name. So of course, there are dozens of cave entrances on private property all over the place. Now farmland in this region has very poor soil and things do not grow well here. So cave tourism as a source of income quickly became the prominent thing. Mm. <laughs> However, a problem. There are a very large number of caves, but there are only a limited number of tourists. So competition rapidly escalated. Visit my cave. No, 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 visit my cave. Mm. Big signs were erected saying, ah, tourists, come to me. Ah, mine is definitely open. Mine is the best. But then competitors would respond by saying, hey, by the way, we're open, but don't go to that one over there. It's really shitty. In fact, it's dangerous. This kept going further. By the end, they were blocking off the trail to each other's property, beating each other in the streets, and hiring people called cappers who would dress up as policemen and tell tourists, no, 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 you can't go in there. That one, no, it's illegal. What? Despite the fierce competition, Floyd found a cave on his property and he started advertising it to tourists. Of course, very few came. Mm. 
All right, he thought. What if I found something really special and unique? Then surely people would have to come to my cave to see it. So he kept exploring and exploring until he found this hollow. It was filled with big gypsum crystals. And when you were in there, it felt like a completely alien world. But it was wow. barely accessible. This small tunnel <clears throat> is the only way in. He would need to dig for months to open it up to tourists. But he knew he could do it. Back to the competition. They knew the value of this cave. They knew the potential. They wanted it for themselves. And they wanted Collins gone. One time, five of them just wandered onto Floyd's property and demanded he hand over the lease. When he refused, they just started beating the shit out of him. This only stopped when Floyd's brother, Homer, marched out <laughs> with a shotgun and chased them all off. But Floyd was not deterred. He spent 12 hours a day, every day, for months, clearing gravel and stone, chipping away at that passage. He would open it up to tourists, make his cave an incredible attraction, and make his dreams come true. So there's Floyd in the dark, yelling out for help. He's at the start of a very tiring loop. Sleep, wake, yell. Sleep, wake, yell. Hours passed. His voice gave in. Arms tingled numb, pain radiating up his ankle. Here he remained in the dark for the next 23 hours. Oh, wow. Quickly, you might wonder, how come no one's come for him after 23 hours? Well, Sand Cave resides on a 200-acre farm. There are several homes on this property with other families. One of them, of course, is Colin's house, where Floyd's father, Lee, resides. Now, Lee and Floyd constantly get into fights about how to run things. Lee wants his son to concentrate on farming, and Floyd wants to concentrate on cave tourism. Arguments would often get heated. And Lee was also a bit of a drunk. It was doubtful that he would even notice if his son Floyd was missing. Shit. Also not helping things, Floyd regularly lodged at two other homes on the farm. So when he didn't return to one host, they would presume that he was staying with the other. And, even worse than that, he had recently spent 30 hours in a cave. So disappearing for this length of time wasn't seen as abnormal. Regardless, around the 23 hour mark, a few locals started to suspect that, hey, something might be wrong, and they went to check up on him. And here, they spotted his jacket still hung up. Unusual. They went deeper. However, there was only one person small enough to make it as far as the turnaround room. This was a 17 year old Jewel Estes. He refused to go into the squeeze, but it was close enough to call Collins' name. Floyd! And Collins yelled back. Yes, I'm here. Estes emerges from the cave. Oh, okay, we know he's trapped, and we know where he is. So, locals started to gather outside. Out of my way. Say a bunch of men who would Damn. each show up and take turns heading into the cave in an attempt to reach Collins. But once they reached the turnaround room... Nope. 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 They would fail to reach him, emerging from the cave, soaked in mud and cursing. Out of my way, they would say as they were heading in the reverse direction. So a few more hours passed. Word would spread around town. Dozens of locals from Cave City started to gather outside. Damn. Over in Louisville, Floyd's 22-year-old brother, Homer, he gets a phone call. Ah, uh, hello? I see. Ah, my brother. He's trapped in a cave? I'm on my way. Homer jumps on a coach and makes his way to Floyd's cave. Homer struts up to the scene. Dozens of men are standing around outside. He ignores them all and marches right into the cavern, still wearing his city clothes. He makes his way in, down the chute, through the narrowing passages, down on his hands and knees towards the turnaround room. And when he arrives, he does not hesitate. 
He squeezes into the hole, scrambles his way through to the ledge on the other side. He sees Floyd below and slides down to meet him. Floyd! Sup? I probably wasn't that casual. <laughs> oh, thank God you're here. Homer took a moment to shine his light around the area and assess the situation. It was not good. This rock formation is going to prove almost impossible to work around. All right, so let's have a look. Floyd is here. The rock is here, pinning his ankle. He's surrounded by rubble, and there's a pocket of gravel above him oh, ready shit. to fall. However, because this opening is so small, there are only two viable ways of reaching Floyd and that gravel. Option one, the most obvious, feet first. But if you do this, you have to kind of squat, and your own torso obstructs access to the rubble. Otherwise, option two, oh. come down head first. That will give you better access, but you're trying to move hundreds of pounds of gravel upside down. Worse yet, there's barely an inch around Collins on either side, so good luck getting your arm down near Floyd's ankle to actually free him from the wedged rock. Homer calls back to the less daring rescuers standing behind him. Quickly, some food and drink. They send it through. He hand feeds his brother a pint of coffee and a total of nine sausage sandwiches. Feeling better? He is Much better. <laughs> then the Homer went to task. He began removing rocks and gravel, tiny scoop at a time, with the help of an old syrup can. Good God. For the next eight hours he toiled, first with hands, then, once enough was cleared, using a crowbar to scoop behind his brother, scraping away sharp protrusions as he went. It was slow progress. Virtually futile. As soon as he removed one rock or scoop of gravel, another would tumble from above and land in the new absence. And it was exhausting work. By sunrise, Homer's arms and back were knackered. His lungs burned. He was losing hope. Homer emerged hours later, shivering violently, skin bruised from his fingertips, but the cave barely yielded at all. However, uh. something new. By the time Homer reached outside, he was greeted by a sea of approximately 100 men and women standing around, drinking, squabbling, and talking big game about how they too were going to save Floyd. The Let's press was also it. present to help people gawk from afar. Now, Homer recuperated at a small tent near the cave's mouth. Strangers immediately crowded around him to ask innocent, but frankly, frustrating questions and offer unsolicited, obvious advice, as well as wildly impractical solutions. He should try untying his shoes, said one. Oh my god. Uh, no, we should send him down with a contortionist who's got a mallet and a chisel. Ah, we, we should jerk him off. Right, guys? <laughs> All right, I made that third guy up. But you get the idea. And they started to argue with each other about their plans. Hey, how about using dynamite? One click formed, insisting that it was a great idea. And another saying, no, 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 the explosion will kill him and the weight of the new rocks will surely crush him. They fought for a while until they started arguing about gas torches which will cook him or asphyxiate him or the gas will poison him but by far the most common suggestion of course was amputation never mind that the foot itself was unreachable and never mind what the blood loss and shock would do to floyd's weakened body and never minding even more that floyd was strongly reluctant to the idea whatever you do don't cut my foot off all of the squabble would not have gotten on homer's nerves except that not one of them would just brave the damn cave and continue shoveling away the gravel. The formula was always the same. Brave heroes go in with food and supplies, then reach the turnaround room and immediately lose their nerve, then dump the food just outside the hole, and then return back outside and go, oh, absolutely, no, he says, thanks for the food, thank you so much. Yum, yum. No one would go through that squeeze. Dozens oh, more shit. men would try, all of them would fail. God damn, February dude. 2nd, 9am. So far, Homer has been the only person to have reached Floyd. 
and that would continue to be true until... Here we are at the Louisville Courier. There's a spirited young news hawk named William Miller. He's talking to his boss, and he's trying to convince him that it's a great idea for him to cover the story of the man trapped in the cave. Listen up, boss. I'm hearing talk of a man in a cave. He's stuck down there, and I want to get down there too. Get to the nitty gritty, you hear? This is an opportunity for some good PR, Miller. I'm in. But I want us to sponsor that rescue. Picture this. Man saved from cave by Louisville Courier, the finest newspaper in the state. That'll drum up plenty of business. 24 carat idea, boss. I'll make it happen. I'll get down there too sweet. So off Miller goes to Floyd's cave. Back over at the cave, Homer is sitting outside trying to recuperate as Miller wanders up. He glares at the man in his city clothes and answers every question with either a grunt or a one-word answer. Eh. Yeah. Sure. Finally, he gestures to Sand Cave. Listen, you want more information? The hole's right behind me. Why don't you go take a look yourself? Now, Miller is only 21, but he is a slender and determined man. He takes on the challenge. So he removes his suit, drapes himself in coveralls, and grabs a lamp. Miller slowly enters the cave. He finds himself stepping in puddles and having to correct his balance against the ever softening walls. These were accumulating problems thanks to the gawkers outside who had lit campfires all around the entrance. That oh. caused snowmelt and the stable environment of the cave hey. is starting to shift. Oh. But Miller makes it further than most. And all that's left is that final squeeze and he's there. He stops. He takes a moment and decides to call out to Floyd. Floyd! Hearing there is someone on the other side, he feels ashamed not to try. So he closes his eyes and moves forward. His slender figure begins inching through. The crystal gypsum cuts into his elbows and tugs at his clothes. He gets snagged. He's fluttering through the pools of muddy water. He stops, collects himself, and pushes on. He can barely inhale. If he gets stuck in here, he can only hope that someone else can come in from behind and pull him out by the legs. But eventually, he makes it through. Fantastic. He's now standing on the edge of a 10-foot pit, and he clumsily bumbles his way down. He sat right next to Floyd, ready to interview him. But Floyd didn't really answer any of his questions. In fact, he was incoherent. At the moment, he is sitting in a pool of water that is 12 degrees, slowly sapping his body temperature. He is dying from exposure. The cold is diminishing Floyd's mental faculties, and he can barely make sentences. So Miller took a few mental notes, and he left. He worked his way back through the squeeze, that, what? past the turnaround room, and out into the daylight. He is covered in mud and scratches and numb head to toe. And when Homer saw, his hope reignited. Someone else had made it to Floyd. You and me, together, we can get Floyd out of there. If Miller hadn't gone to that cave, there's a good chance that Floyd's story would have remained an obscure footnote in the back pages. But the interviews and first-person accounts gave the audience a glimpse of something real. Fear, hope, desperation, the full range. And so, from Los Angeles to New York, Floyd's story was picked up everywhere and described the Kentucky man's plight in sensational detail. It was also the era when radio became a regular feature for regular Americans. Radio allowed something new, hourly updates, letting people get engrossed into the story. So, mostly thanks to Miller, the story of Floyd over the next week would grow and grow seemingly frothing over into every aspect of American life. The press at large would be clamoring over each other for every little extra scrap of detail they could get about Floyd. And everybody wanted to know, will this man make it? A lot of people won't. Back outside the cave, someone him. new enters the scene. Lieutenant Robert Burden, a thin but strong 33-year-old Louisville firefighter. Like Miller, he was able to navigate the passages of the cave and brave the squeeze. Scratched up pretty good and drenched in cold, muddy water, he managed to get through. He grabbed the rope and confidently lowered himself to Floyd's position. 
it was not an optimistic sight. Floyd's condition was deteriorating. Well, we've got a heck of a problem here, but I think I can get you out with a rope. Floyd nods in approval. Go on. We might just pull your bloody leg off. Just pull my leg off then. Get me out of here. Burton returned to the surface and faced the crowd. Dude, before he, he gets there, we will I attempt. thought the only way that I could imagine in this time period of doing this is getting a long ass rope, yeah, me too. tying it to some horses and pulling oh, his they ass got horses. out. Ugh. I mean, well, all those men, they could probably maybe. It would be easier to do with horses, and like, I mean, they don't have equipment like that. Yeah, they but just you would have don't... to like go at a pace that's not just gonna. I mean, you would the, have to have people cut. along the way. Yeah, to, Ugh. But I don't. It, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all I could think of. A rope pull. The crowd moved. It was dangerous. It would certainly break his foot and could altogether pull it off. If there are jagged rocks, you'll fill it, the poor man. Amongst the crowd, a doctor stepped forward. A rope pull could stretch his internal organs and cause them to rupture. You'll kill him. But Floyd is dying of exposure down there. What are you going to do? The situation is becoming desperate. Burden put caution to the side. The time for strategy is over. Now we try brute force. Jesus. After 79 hours in the cold water, he is delirious, fading in and out of consciousness. Homer gave his brother some coffee and fed him a couple of ham sandwiches. That warms him up and gives him a bit more energy, and he comes back to lucidity. Oh, much better. I'm gonna put the special harness around you. Burden and Miller, they're here too. We got three more boys right up the cave, and they're all ready to pull as hard as they can to get you out of here. Floyd was frightened. I'm not going to lie, it's going to hurt. He gave his brother some whiskey and a strong sedative to calm his nerves, and also to help him withstand the shock in case his foot is destroyed. Floyd took the opportunity to appreciate being surrounded by friends and family. Go on, do it. All right, strap him up. Homer tied the harness around Colin's chest and knotted the rope. Ready. Above, Miller is crouched at the top of the pit. Ready. Burden clenches the cord from further up the cave. Three. The rope goes taut. Two. Do it. One. Oh. Rope breaks. Instinctively, Floyd gasps. The force of six men pulled against the clutches of the cave. Floyd began to scream. His body was being pulled up from the rubble. The gravel was beginning to shift. Burden clenched his teeth. Oh, harder. Floyd screamed harder as well. Now, Floyd was trapped in a supine position. But the direction of the rope caused an upwards force that wrenched him vertically. His torso was being compressed and bent against the ceiling of the trap. It would kill him. Floyd's screaming intensified, and through gasps was begging them to stop. The screams filled the echoing cave, but it did not stop. The agony continued, on and on, with no progress. Enough! Enough! You guys are killing him! Homer pulled in the opposite stop. direction to give his brother some reprieve. Somehow, Homer mustered the strength to altogether wrench the cord from the other men's hands. The rope went slack. Homer, Floyd, and the rope lay limp on the cave floor, panting and exhausted. No progress had been made. The cave would not let this man go. The futility they of the situation Abraham, sank in, and all they could do was leave for now and reassess. Everybody was shaken by the experience. <sighs> Burden fainted as he crawled towards the exit. Most of the other men had to be carried away. Outside, the crowd had grown to 200. They buzzed and asked useless questions, and Homer walked dejectedly past them. 
He sat by thinking what he could do. The cause seemed hopeless. Homer? Then, someone showed up who could turn things around. He looked up to see a childhood friend of both his and Floyd's, Johnny Gerald. Gerald knew more about cave rescues than most. In fact, just that summer prior, he had helped untangle Floyd from a different snag. He was just the man for the job. All right, let me go see him. Well, look who it is. Floyd perked up immediately, <laughs> thrilled to see Gerald. All right, let's see what we can do. Gerald jumped down. For the next three hours, Gerald went back to the original plan of prying away rocks. His stamina was good, and progress was surprisingly good as well. For several more hours, he continued, just moving stone after stone. New one would fall in his place, and he'd move that one too. By midnight, he had enough room to shift position and clear some of the gravel that was at each side of Floyd's body. Gerald would spend several more hours scooping, and it worked. For the first time, Floyd's torso was now available. So you have three then people his hips, who can do that. His upper thigh. For the first time in over 90 hours, Floyd was able to wiggle his arms, his hips, and even that trapped right leg, though oh it was God. very painful to do. In that one session, Gerald managed to move a half ton of rock. Oh but there was God. still a lot more to go. And that rock by his foot was still holding him in place. By 2 a.m., Gerald was spent. He needed rest, and he was ready to head back outside. Floyd, tomorrow you're gonna be a free man. Uh, now here you might think that things will become straightforward. They did not. Now that that space had been cleared, Burden became convinced that if he could get down that passage again, he could free Floyd with another rope pull. Fate deciding, with both feet or just one, <sighs> But when Burden tried to enter the cave again, he was sternly rebuffed by the locals. They were playing gatekeeper. They had been specifically instructed to not let anyone in, and they were especially opposed to Burden making another rope pull after word spread about the disaster of the first attempt. He tried to reason with them. Let me try the rope pull again. It'll work this time. They wouldn't let up. Instead, they shouted obscenities and shoved him <laughs> in the other direction. Damn. Meanwhile, Gerald and Homer are incapacitated with exhaustion, and Miller was busy filing some paperwork for the Louisville Courier. Nobody else had the ability or the authority to take action, so Floyd spent all of that morning alone. Hello? Is anyone there? Help? Hey? Anyone out there? Word spread about Floyd. Miller's reporting had been picked up by the AP Newswire, and they distributed it amongst their hundreds of partnered newspapers. For Miller, it would be the biggest moment of his career. But he didn't stop to pay it mind. He spent the day hatching a rescue plan. Miller descended into the cave and set to work. When he entered, he found that the team before him had strung light bulbs all through the cavern, leading all the way down to Floyd. Very handy. A bulb was also put around Floyd's neck to keep him warm and make sure that he was never again left in the dark. Miller popped down to Floyd. Ah, Floyd! Fancy seeing you here, buddy! Reusing that syrup tin, he started <laughs> offloading gravel into buckets. Those buckets were then passed up and down the cavern. Hey, exactly. And so it went on Jeez. for the next two hours. Miller stopped for a break. He took some bread, milk, and whiskey, and sharing it with Floyd, they started to get to talking. Floyd had been in that cave for over 100 hours now, and seeing everyone working together, Floyd was overcome with a sense of hope and relief. And so he began spilling his heart out to Miller. Here is what he is quoted in the newspaper. I believed I would go to heaven. I can feel that I'm to be taken out alive and with both my feet. I kept thinking, what would happen if the rock above me would fall? It, it caused me to shudder. I kept thinking to drive my mind to something else, but it wasn't much use. I couldn't do much to help those who came to help me, but I knew that a lot of people were willing to do all in their power. It gave me courage. Tuesday morning I thought to myself, four days down here, 
and no nearer freedom than I was on the first day. How will it end? Will I get out? I couldn't think of it. I have faced death before. It doesn't frighten me, but it is so long. Tell them I am not going to give up. Tell them I am going to fight and be patient and never forget them. Meanwhile, Floyd's story kept growing. Pedestrians would gather around corner store windows to read the latest bulletins. The press began using giant typefaces, commonly only reserved for declarations of war. Churches in all of the nearby counties were holding services for Floyd. Theatres even interrupted their shows to update the audience. Now, at the time, President Coolidge was in charge, oh and his Secretary of Commerce was a geologist, Herbert Hoover. Now, Mr. Hoover followed the story very closely, and so it was likely that the president did too. Even Congress paused session to ask about the latest news from Sand Cave. By the end, the Floyd Collins incident would explode into the third largest non-political story between World War I and World War II. All of this excitement brought an inundation of people to Cave City. Old population, 690. Yawn. New population, 10,000. Hotels ran out of food. Residents turned their homes into makeshift hotels, charging sizable premiums to let people nap in their bathtubs. The banks quickly ran out of on-hand cash, and 4,500 automobiles impatiently sat, backed up for two miles from 20 different states to drive onto the Collins wow. farm and turn their pristine green pastures into swampy parking lots. Deep below all those tourists, there's Miller, trying to free Floyd. All right, a little bit of setup. Floyd, Miller, some remaining rubble, rock. For anyone to lift the rock by hand would be impossible because Floyd's body obstructs the hole. Miller grabs a crowbar and shoves it through the gap. Now he's going to lever it off Floyd's foot. Cool. The crowbar is now wedged against the rock. Next, he takes a jack. He positions it on top of the crowbar so that it will be forced against the ceiling. However, problem. That jack is too big. It doesn't fit. Miller yells up the tunnel for a smaller one, but this took some time. And when it arrived, too small, won't reach the ceiling. But instead of sending for another one, Miller takes two blocks of wood and bolsters them underneath the crowbar. Right, so the crowbar now sits higher, it fulcrums against the blocks, and the jack is sitting on top. All Miller has to do is expand the jack, which he will do using this spanner, holding it at the very tips of his fingers. Sounds easy. It's not, but that's the plan. Let's get him out of there. He turned the wrench, the jack expanded, and the crowbar took strain. The whole thing slid apart yeah. with a pang. Floyd wasn't hurt, but Miller was contorting and exerting his whole body from back to fingertip. Like a crowbar they tried again, very wide. same result. Miller tried a new angle. Maybe this time, the jack pressed, the tension increased and this time the rock moved it fucking moved with each turn the stone shifted a little more miller's hands shook with adrenaline his face and body dripping with sweat pang one of the blocks slipped and the wooden tower went sideways the rock painfully slammed back down on colin's foot ah, you'll get it next time miller try again miller did again and again adding blocks, taking them away, new crowbar position, change the jack position, every angle, all while Floyd was there, cheering him on. Yay. Yay. This is so stressful. Oh, no. Four hours he tried. No progress. Miller was exhausted. He couldn't do this on his own, but he was the only one slim enough to get in through the gap. The group decided to concede for now and return to the surface. They would take just a small break, but it looked to everyone like there was a clear way to get this man out. So Miller and Burden crawl back through the mud and the winds of the cave. As they made their way through, the cave was visibly sagging. The ceiling seemed lower. Parts were harder to navigate than before, especially now with their bruised and purple hands. But they made it outside to the fresh early morning air. 
And here is where they're greeted with a new sight. Dozens of soldiers. The National Guard had arrived. In addition to the National Guard, a new figure was joining the story, Henry Carmichael. Now, Carmichael was the general superintendent of the Kentucky Rock Asphalt Company. He had been on site since Tuesday, and he was appalled at how primitive the rescue attempts had been. Shortly after Miller and co. had exited, Carmichael sent two men into Sand Cave to assess the structure's stability. They soon came back with a report. It was not good. Near the final squeeze, large cracks had formed. The ceiling was beginning to droop. Oh my god. All right, so the following is a recounting of events from one of Carmichael's men, Casey Jones. <clears throat> Casey and another worker spent about an hour in the cave surveying its condition, looking at the boards, the ceiling, the stability of the walls. He continued deeper towards Floyd. He was fighting against his nerves. The shifting of the rock pinged his every instinct to flee. But he heard Collins moaning ahead, so he pushed himself on. He managed to make it through the squeeze and he arrived at the 10-foot pit. Seeing Floyd trapped, he tried to ignore the pebbles that were tumbling behind him. Please, come down. Uh, I can't right now, Floyd, but I will when I get back. Behind Casey, his partner is begging to leave. Below Casey, Collins is pleading for help. Please, I'm so thirsty. Okay. Casey slid headfirst into the pit and hastily ladled Floyd some coffee. But Floyd what? rejected Just it. Coffee, no. coffee, coffee. The rumbling intensified from above. And in that moment, Casey realized that this was not a plea for sustenance. Floyd knew that a cave in was inevitable. Scared and approaching his fifth day trapped, he was completely at his wit's end. He knew he was about to be trapped in that cave and he didn't want to be trapped alone. For God's sake, Casey, come on, you'll get us killed. Stay with me, please, don't leave. Casey looked into Colin's eyes, set the coffee down, and pulled himself out of the pit. He wiggled underneath the sagging ceiling and crawled towards the turnaround room as fast as his limbs could scramble against the cave walls. He looked back to see the passage closing like a maw. Reflections from the bulb shining around Floyd's neck were no longer visible. Instead, just sobs could be heard, muffled from behind the rocks. Miller and Burden awoke in the late morning, confident that today would be the day oh, that they God. saved Floyd. They had some new equipment too. Some wire to wrap around the wooden blocks to prevent them from slipping. And they changed their mind about that acetylene torch. They'll use it to burn away two rocks that had previously blocked their way. But when Miller got to the turnaround room, all of that optimism left him. The entrance to the squeeze was now just a pile of debris. Miller froze, staring at it for a long while. Then he sighed and did the only thing he could think, attempt to move some of the stones. But each adjustment led to more rocks just tumbling down and landing in that space. He persisted until... Crash. A large chunk of clay landed onto his feet. Recognising the danger, Miller returned to the surface. Fifteen minutes later, he emerged from the cave with a bloodied up nose and bruises down his back and shoulders. Burden caught sight and races over to him. Miller just says, For God's sake, just don't let Homer or anyone else back in there. Now, he didn't actually need to worry about Homer going back in there because he was sidelined with illness. But he did, however, need to worry about Gerald because he was furious. Gerald had warned everyone that putting dozens of people in Sand Cave would cause a collapse. It certainly did. The rest of that day would be wasted as men threw blame around and screamed at each other about how to handle the cave-in. And Floyd spent the rest of that day alone. The surveyors continued checking the cave throughout the day. By the evening, Carmichael had ordered everyone to an assembly. Gerald took the floor. He was going to try one last daring rescue. He boldly announced his plan and an ultimatum. Listen up. 
There's death down there. The walls and ceilings are crumbling. Unless you're determined to take the biggest chance you ever took in your life, tell me now and stay outside. Next, they told all the Gorkas to get the fuck out of the cave, clear off. And over the next eight hours, Gerald would enter and leave Sand Cave at least five times, chipping away at that pile of debris. In the woods, men sawed trees and chopped logs to shore up the cave walls. Underground, the crew reinforced cracks and wobbling boulders with fresh strips of wood. Gerald assessed that about four barrels of rocks would need to be moved, and piece by piece, they made that happen. Steadily. They managed to move enough rock to allow Gerald to get within earshot of Floyd. Hey, hello, I need food. Bad news, we can't reach you, but hold on, we're coming. Stone by stone, they continued. After a few hours, the light of the bulb around Floyd's neck was peeking through. A couple more hours, enough room for Gerald to squeeze through. Okay, that's enough. Floyd, I'm going for now, but when I get back, I'm gonna get you out of there. Exhausted but still determined, Gerald crawled back up the cave and marched to the men huddling outside. Gather the equipment, and in an hour's time, it's gonna be me and Floyd coming out of that cave. Gerald entered Sand Cave for his final time. The walls had been reinforced, but mud and water was accumulating everywhere. He waded through it and pressed on past the danger of the sagging ceiling. With determination on his face and a grease gun clutched in his right hand, he scrambled towards Floyd. But before the final squeeze, he stopped. It was all gone. The cave ceiling had crumbled once again. Gerald stared motionlessly at the pile. Then he began to yell. Floyd! A rock disconnected from the ceiling and tumbled onto Gerald's head. Luckily, just a small one. He rubbed his scalp and called out again. Floyd! This time, a moan. It rumbled from the other side. Fearing that his friend was slipping out of consciousness, Gerald willed himself against the cave, launching the debris behind him with force. He ignored the pain from being struck on the head and clawed at the stone pile. He carried on this way for several minutes until a sharp, heavy rock dropped from the ceiling and landed squarely on his back. No more than 15 minutes later, Gerald returned to the surface, defeated. Only after the cave did they start to think about all of the things that they could have done. Wait! Why didn't we rig a portable telephone line? That would have been incredibly simple here in 1925. Yeah, why have we been running in and out to deliver updates? Why didn't we give him an AM radio? He could have had something to listen to and receive messages of support from the public. Wait, why don't we rig up a tarpaulin so we could lift his torso up so he wouldn't be slowly dying of exposure? Oh god, why didn't we run a feeding tube? That's also a technology we have in 1925. All too late. Now what? The one route to get to Floyd is closed forever. That meant two options. Number one, capitulation. Surrender him to the cave. Or number two, dig down from directly above Floyd. Now the prospect of digging from above seemed almost fanciful. At least it did in the beginning. But luckily, they had some help. Owing to Miller's reporting, Floyd had become practically the most famous person in the country. The rescue had become a high priority for the governor of Kentucky. Lieutenant General Denhart enters the scene. He's been updated on the situation, and following shortly behind him is a small army of miners and engineers. He declared to the despondent crowd, gentlemen, I am here on behalf of the governor. The purse strings of Kentucky are open. Take this blank check and bring that man out alive. 
Floyd in that cold, wet confine could not have imagined the scale of the operation that was going I mean, on 55 feet I'm above sure, him. completely helpless at this point. Authorities assumed control of Colin's rescue. Dinhart gave Henry Carmichael the lead to dig, and Carmichael raced to get to work. He enlisted his employees, his fleet of expensive high-tech machinery. Professional groups were brought in from all across the state. Local townspeople were mostly excluded. And for the first time since Collins had been trapped, work was now about to go ahead in a systematic manner. Everyone knew the plan, everyone had something to do, and everyone was working fast. But just as hopes were rising, they were once again dashed against the rocks. They had all of this state-of-the-art machinery shipped in and assembled by the engineers and rearing to go. And it was all worthless. See, the problem is the cave drew air into it. These diesel-powered engines pumped out enormous volumes of choking exhaust. Within a day's operation, the cave would be filled with carbon monoxide and Floyd would be dead from asphyxiation. Oh my God. Just as quickly as solutions would arise, the cave would parry them away. It refused to let this man go. So engineers and miners had wasted hours assembling everything, only to realize that they had to pack it all up and cart it away. Because the digging of a 55-foot shaft would be done with picks and shovels. Carmichael didn't know much about caves, but he knew a lot about quarrying. And he estimated that his team of 75 volunteers could dig and dredge at a rate of two feet per hour. If they worked around the clock, they would be digging directly into the spot where Floyd lays within 30 hours. Now, was it possible that Floyd could survive for another 30 oh, hours? I've been down there for so long. Absolutely. Let's go. The first ton was moved, and at first it was easy work. Just dirt and clay. Carmichael understood well that this was a race against time, so he watched the men closely, and if they seemed to be slowing down, even a little, they would be yanked out and immediately a new worker subbed in. Nonetheless, the pace slowed. By 10 feet, the shaft narrowed greatly, which meant that only two men could work at a time. At 15 feet, they hit boulders. Pickaxes went in, and a system of pulleys and buckets had to be used to cart the rock out. Tracks were even laid to ferry the refuse to a dump site. Time passed. Hours passed. Night went to day. The day was hot. This was yet another problem, because it's early February, there's tons of ice still in the ground, and its exposure to the fresh midday sun meant that the walls of the shaft were softening and the ground becoming sodden. The pace of digging slowed. It was now only half a foot per hour. Most uh. anyone could do was watch helplessly on the sidelines and pray. Interestingly though, there were a lot of people on the sidelines. Floyd wouldn't have believed that the space above him had turned into a literal carnival in his honor. Vendors showed up to sell hamburgers, hot dogs, and souvenirs. Families sprawled out over blankets to listen to hymns from local church groups. The local mountebanks sold moonshine and miracle cures. There was even a bloody juggler. And old man Lee was there, walking around, shaking his jar, and soliciting donations. But where were Homer and Burden and Miller during all of this? Okay, let's back up a bit. People did not properly understand exactly how Floyd was trapped, and the news didn't help much either. So the obvious question started to arise. Why hasn't he been rescued yet? Just clear some gravel or pull a rope. How is this so hard? Motive was attributed. I heard they didn't even want to have him rescued at all. I heard that they're doing all of this for publicity. Oh and God. Lee's activity of soliciting donations, remember from before, further inflamed rumours. I bet Floyd isn't even trapped in there. These were all real I mean, rumours, and they got worse. You know what? I've heard he comes out at night, and then he just goes back in in the morning. Other rumours included... I heard that after Floyd went into the cave, someone murdered him. 
Others said, I think they're withholding food and water from him so he dies. This whole thing is a fraud. As time went on, it was harder and harder to ignore the hoax claims. Then, people started to form righteous mobs, claiming the whole thing was a fraud, and they started oh to God. get nasty. In fact, two people even went to the telegraph office and pretended to be Floyd sending telegrams to his mother. Here's what it said. Quote, Please contradict statements that I am buried alive in Sand Cave. Stop. Tell mother I am all right. Stop. Am coming home. Stop. Why would you Floyd do that? Collins. Why would you do Naturally, that? Naturally, the AP published these telegrams unquestioningly, and now word is out to the press that he isn't actually in the cave after all. So it's not just social that media. made the authorities it's look foolish. people. And it could not go on. So, a hasty court-martial was arranged, and Homer, Miller, and Gerald were summoned. They hold one session on Monday and another on Tuesday. Lee and everyone else is cleared of charges. A retraction is written and things carry on. Ha, dude. Generators rumbled. Pumps churned out water. Men continued working in shifts and carrying away the earth. Here they are with strips of lumber to shore up the walls. They were only 25 feet down. The pace had slowed to four inches per hour. Damn. In their desperation, they resorted to dynamite. But this did little to the boulders. Despite all these bleak circumstances, people's spirits were high because everyone was keen for their turn to dig. And because they had one more thing to latch onto. He is probably still alive. Now, how do they know that? Okay. So remember that light bulb around Floyd's neck? Well, it's powered by a simple copper wire. Bare copper wire is subject to very minute fluctuations in resistance. So, an engineer rigs up a radio amplifier to this wire to read the current and see those small fluctuations. His heartbeat. There they were. About 20 per minute. The rate of steady breathing. Oh, okay. As his chest expands and contracts, they can read it from this device. And so, they kept going. Mate, my milk dogs only have two left. And going. And going. 30 hours was the original estimate. Now 144 hours had come and gone, and they were only at 44 feet. Wow. Then... Rain, oh. rain oh. that mixed with dirt to make mud, much of which then froze to make ice. Ice which expanded and damaged the integrity of the shaft walls. Slowing down with every hour, they continued. Many more hours passed and they were getting close. But it was now 15 days since Floyd was first stuck in that cave and people had mostly lost hope. That excitement in the newspapers was tempering down. Visitors began clearing out from Cave City. Many still held on to hope, but their final lifeline, that light bulb, had burnt out. And it wasn't possible to do any more readings on the radio amplifier without it. No one knew if Floyd was still alive. Another 51 hours would pass before, finally, they reached the 60-foot depth. I'm in. Chisel. A chisel is handed down. At 1.30 p.m. on Monday, February 16th, Sand Cave would open once again. For 17 days, Floyd had been trapped underground, stuck in the same position. Four days without heat or light. Twelve without food or water. But maybe the dripping of the cave water had provided him with some sustenance? There are stories of people surviving harsher extremes. Rescuers frantically tugged at rocks to widen the hole. Everybody stood by, absolutely silent, now peering in the into that here. hole. Ed flashed his light into the gap, then eased himself in. Brenner aimed his light around the room, and then finally at Floyd. The first thing he saw was a golden shimmer. It was not the light bulb. It was the reflection of Floyd's tooth. 
His mouth hung open. He was dead. Fucking hell. Brenner was helped out of the cave and he delivered the news. Dead. A coroner would later state that Floyd succumbed to exposure and that they had missed him by just three days. About the same time that the light bulb had gone out. But what would they do now with the body? The shaft walls were ready to fall inwards, and risking lives to remove a corpse was seen as just irresponsible. So the following morning, officials made a decision. Floyd would be entombed where he lay. The cave would keep its victim. Now this did not sit well with the family, but what could they do? The next day, they planned the funeral. The town emptied of people and the shaft with Floyd at the bottom was refilled with soil. But that's not quite the end of the story. But if you hung on for this long, keep holding on, because things are going to continue to get interesting. But first, let me do a wrap up where everyone is and all that stuff, context, context. The Collins family already had financial hardship. Locals saw old man Lee scouring the rescue site for glass bottles. But the owner of the lamb, B. Doyle, and supposed friend of Floyd, was wholly unsympathetic. He erected a sign on the highway which said, 200 yards away, the body of Floyd Collins is imprisoned in Sand Cave. Then he began charging tourists 50 cents apiece for the opportunity to gander into the hole. It's 100 years later, B's dead. Let's call it even. Also, remember those claims of Kentucky being an open purse? Well, the state reneged on the deal. They refused to pay many of the rescuers, and most of them went home without any compensation. Wow. Some of them did make some money out of the situation, though. They lucked into vaudeville gigs and roamed the country, giving their first-person account. Miller, however, received an astonishing offer, a $50,000 contract from the Chautauqua Lecture Circuit, equivalent to the better part of a million dollars in today's money. He declined. He continued to work at the Louisville Courier Journal. The following year, his coverage of Floyd's story earned him the Pulitzer Prize. Now the brother, Homer, he needed money and he agreed to do that vaudeville circuit. He stood on stage and regaled the audience about tales of his brother, their childhood and the tragedy. But Homer made it known why he was up here on stage trying to get money. He had a mission. I kept thinking of Floyd lying in the muck where he had suffered beyond our power to imagine. I would never have peace of mind if he remained there. He wanted the money to dig Floyd up and get him out of that cave. A couple of months later, he had it. All right, so back to Floyd. April 17th, 1925. Seven miners showed up to the scene. They began to dig. Within a week, they had arrived at Floyd. And this time, they approached from the other side of the rock formation. That way, they could remove the rock pinning Floyd's leg. They lifted him up from his tomb and laid him down on the fresh air above. April 26th, 1925. Floyd was set to rest in the family cemetery. A stalagmite had been set as a headstone to mark out his plot. And there he lay for... No, that's not actually where it ends. Okay, this is where it gets weird. Two years later, 1927. Times have been tough for the Collins. So Floyd's dad sold Sand Cave to a dentist named Dr. Harry B. Thomas for $10,000. Now, Homer begged him not to, because at the time, the government was starting to buy up tons of land in the area and turn it into national parks. They had to pay at a very competitive rate. But Lee was becoming a bit old and senile by this point, and frankly, it's doubtful that he cared about Homer or Floyd or anyone else for that matter. It's 100 years later, He's dead now, let's call it even. So, the point is, in this land sale with Thomas, Lee agreed to a very odd clause. And that clause said, everything on that property belongs to Thomas. And should he wish, for example, to exhume a dead body and re-embalm it and put it on display in something really tacky like a, I don't know, a glass coffin inside a cave, maybe, then that would be his prerogative. Lee signed yes. 
and Thomas did exactly that. Doyle made Floyd's corpse a tourist attraction. That's right. Two bits of gander come and wonder at the incredible dead man who died in a cave. But to add insult to injury, it worked. Visitors returned to Sand Cave to gawk morbidly at Floyd. Within a few months, Thomas had turned Lee's failing farm into a successful business. This is unfucking believable, dude. Now the rest of Colin's family is horrified. They try a number of times to get Floyd returned to them, including through the legal system. But somehow, incredibly, the judge ruled in Thomas's favor. And so, there he lay for the next two years. The cave was not done with Floyd. Until someone hatched a plan. Two years later, it's midnight, outside Sand Cave. Footsteps can be heard rustling through the brush. Now, we don't know who these two men are, but we know why they are here. To rob a grave. They sneak inside and clamor over the rocks in the darkness. Reaching Floyd's casket, they undo the latch and throw open the lid. There is his shriveled body. They throw him in a gunny sack and they race off into the night. For 800 yards they carry dear Floyd like a couple of sweaty Santas about to deliver a really terrible Christmas present. Panting, out of breath, knowing that they're going to get caught any minute, they reach the Kentucky Green River hillside. There's no time! With a one, two, three, they launch his body towards the river and Floyd goes sailing into the air, up, up, into the starlit beyond, and landing in a bush. Oh, God. Oh, my fucking God. The two men flee from the scene. Now, the next morning, Thomas notices that the body of Floyd is somewhat missing, and he contacts the authorities. The police come, they dust the casket for fingerprints, and bloodhounds are given Floyd's scent and let loose into the hillside. A few hours later, they manage to find him. A tangled up mess near the river, but this time with a leg missing, that oh. same one that was trapped under the rock. So despite his protest, it had been amputated. Neither the leg nor the culprits were ever found. And while it would be nice to think that this was some well-intentioned duo that did this out of the kindness of their hearts to free Floyd, it's much more likely that it was an act of vandalism because Floyd was simply too much of a hot tourist attraction. The following day, Floyd was passed back into the cave, oh back into his box, and it was covered by a metal lid, surrounded by a metal chain, and locked with a padlock. He was now more trapped than he had ever been. This cave had spun fate once again to make sure that its victim would never leave. And so, time passed. Floyd's body would continue to decay. The rot from his body would eventually rot the casket too, and every decade or so it would need to be replaced. A few years later he was no longer on display. But even then, he remained in that box for many more years. In 1961, Floyd's Cave was purchased by Mammoth Cave National Park, and it was closed to the public. There would be no more visitors. The entrance itself to Floyd's Cave was closed with a steel gate and bolted, then welded shut. But the Collins family never gave up objecting to Collins' body being left in the cave. And here, is where the story ends. In 1989, at the Collins request, the National Park Service ventured into Floyd's cave. Continuing on a more than 60 year tradition, a team of people worked over the course of several days to remove him from the cave. They took him out, left the cave, locked it behind them, and laid Floyd to rest at the Mammoth Thank Cave Baptist God. Church. Jesus. After 64 years in Sand Cave, he is now finally at peace. The end. Thank you to Wendagoon as Floyd.
if you don't let me out, I'm going to hire a gang of hitmen to come to your house and kill your family. So Mito as Homer. The BTS meal McDonald's bag that has I'm McDonald's hungry. And BTS. Shut the fuck up and eat some BTS, bro. Ordinary things as Miller. I'm enthusiastic, but would ultimately dock out the back exit. Rusty Cage as Gerald. Oh, well, hello there. Haven't seen y'all in a while. Welcome to my new home. And many kudos as Burden. Hey, hey, buddy. You're right down there. I can. You're sleepy. I can. Oh. I can. Yeah. We get your coffee. Cold and little cup, little cup of joe. Nobody cup wants Joseph? to give this man water. Cup of Joseph from the little sleepy guy. Also, by the way, in case you're confused about the channels, this is how it works now. And do not forget, World of Tanks, World of Tanks. None oh of this God. would have happened if World Floyd of Tanks, had World of Tanks. World of Tanks. So it must not be the same cave that I'm thinking of. Because if they shut it down and Yeah, put... maybe not the same. But many caves look like that. So the entrance to them anyway. It would be easy to get them confused. There's a sand cave near here. But that sand cave is like five and a half or so hours yeah. away. Wow. What the fuck? I feel like the shittiest thing of all this was that, like, the the way they were acting about it at the end wasn't the way that they were acting about it in the beginning. What like, do you mean? There wasn't as much of a give a fuck from the people that were capable to really help. I don't feel like that. I feel like they're probably just exhausted at this point. I feel like he had two people on his side, and that was his brother mm -hmm. and his their, friend. Their friend, yeah. And everybody else just didn't well, give a fuck. Well, the firefighter dude that wanted to pull him out of there was He tried. Trying. He tried, but that was later. And he actually made it through that turnaround. Point. Yeah, so there were only like... So you really have to have just a few people on your side. But, uh, I feel like they could have got enough skinny boys down there, I mean, not boys, but men, to at least, at the beginning, just get all of that rubble. Yeah. And they probably could have saved them. But everybody's too chicken shit to fucking squabble their way through. I don't yeah. know. It's really annoying to me and disturbing to me because I'm already like, fuck, going into holes like that. I'm not trying to crawl through no nothing. holes. Well, certain holes, but not. I'm not trying to go spelunking and be in dirt and debris. Could have happened to me. Feet and feet and feet of sediment and dirt and rock and everything. No, I'm not fucking around these caves, man. There's a cave close to us, and I've been wanting us to go on a date. But it's not like... It's like a cavern. I don't like it. It's not like you're shimmying around. I don't around. like it. I, I just... To me, I feel like... The effort that was given at the end when they were like, fuck, he's maybe only got a few hours left, and they were finally picked a plan, stuck to it, everybody's working hard. Like, that's what you need when shit like this yeah. goes down to begin with. If there were that many people out there just fucking around trying to be nosy and shit, y'all mm -hmm. could fucking get help. The, yeah, but also get out of here. And when there's people that are like, hey... You know, all these fires and all this going in and out. Well, they didn't fuck probably up the structure. Know. Yeah, that one guy was protesting about oh. everybody being there and the water pulling and stuff. And he was like, this is going to fuck up the infrastructure of the cave. It's going to collapse. You know, that's what they almost had him. It pisses me off that people had to make it about themselves. Like those two people who like sent his mama a telegram right. or Why whatever people, the fuck. And people do that whenever like kids get abducted and stuff. They'll write letters saying that they're them and people are really, crazy. really, really, really fucked up. Fucking crazy. Yeah. You don't need Facebook or Twitter or any of these fucking things for people to be shit bags and fuck with other people. Like, it's shitty, yeah. Why are there that many people out there just drinking? Oh, what's going on? Get your ass down there and find out. Yeah. I don't know. Gawkers. Anyway, that was Man in a Cave. We finally watched it. We watched it. And it was it. ridiculous. You can quit commenting. Holy shit. Man in and a cave, I'm heartbroken at the fact that the guy died in the end. I know. That was I so really, sad. He held on I was for so, a long yeah, time. I was so hoping that he could... Um, make it. I but. feel like just a few days and I'd be like, all right, no, oh. yeah, no, fuck this. Half a month? That's a lot. Two I, weeks? He really, no. and they kept saying like, next time when I come back, I'm gonna get you out of there. But it didn't work out it that way. It didn't work out. 
sad. And he anyway, didn't want that one guy to leave because he knew. Right. That's so sad. Internet historian, once again, bringing us to uh, some crazy shit that we never had heard of and probably would have never heard of until... And kind of in this. our backyard. Yeah, yeah, well, in a neighboring state, yeah. for sure. Kentucky is just right over the hill from us. Um, so, interesting stuff. Sad. Um, fucking crazy. Yeah, but and thank you guys dentist. for recommending. Oh, we didn't even I, talk I about that. I can just that. keep on rattling. The dude He's that the most was fucked profited up. off of his body and displaying him in the hole was just fucking wicked. The worst. Dude. That's so bad. The worst. It's the worst. And um, it's like his luck after he died was like so yeah, bad. Terrible. Um, but thank you guys for recommending this video. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with us and, and watching this with us. If you have not, you should go subscribe to Internet Historian's yes. channel. Give him some likes on his videos. And if you wanted to do the same for us, subscribe, yeah. like this reaction. We would really appreciate mm -hmm. that. Um, and if you wanted to give us some recommendations for things you want to see us react to in the future, you can do that. Yes, I know I gave you all shit that you're commenting. We really do appreciate it, though. We do. Um, we did plan on getting to this sooner but we finally did it but you can comment below you can do that on our discord or if you are a patron on our patreon you can leave it there but um yeah our live streams schedule for that monday and thursday evenings at 6 30 eastern standard time we will be reacting to some stuff sometimes uh we will be playing some games sometimes we'll be vlogging sometimes yeah. we do all kinds of stuff it's kind of just whatever we feel like doing we'll let you know though uh nikki's playing resident evil right now we do live streaming reactions on thursdays at 2 p.m eastern standard time exclusively on twitch if you guys want to hang out with us for that you can It'd be cool it's what we're doing right now yep. with aquafinussy connoisseur dr dale Tom uh thomas horton we've got some of the homies hanging out with us and uh, if you want to be a part of that you can tune in yeah. we would love to have you but for this reaction i think that's gonna that's do it gonna do it see you guys see you can Whoa, la, 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 la. <laughs> to recuperate as Miller wanders up, he glares at the man. Shorty. Shorty! You're so cute, but you cannot just sit at our feet and cry. Come here. Oh, goodness. Oh, say hi, Turdy. Well, they can't even see him. Guess who gets to go to the vet tomorrow? Oh, my gosh. Shorty gets to go to the vet. Hi. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Give him kisses. Oh, gosh. You better give him kisses. Why are you trying to play right now? Oh gosh. Oh gosh. That'd be easy. It's like, I don't want to I don't want to be easy. <laughs> good to see you. Oh, Thank you. Oh, good.